Hello everyone, welcome back to the analyst for 4th of June 2024 where we will be discussing 9 most important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. In the very first article, we will be looking into the latest Lok Sabha election results and actually how the votes are actually counted. In the next one, we will be looking into the Mission Karma Yogi which is actually a very very important piece of editorial and also a very important scheme when it comes to reforming the civil services of our country. In the next one, we will be looking into the constitutional right to property and the various aspects and the legal cases related to compensation. In the next article, we will be looking into the economic concepts of bond yields. And in the final article, we will be looking into a very science and take important article from the perspective of green bird genes. And finally, uh, we will be concluding with prelim snippet where we will be discussing four more important aspects for prelims examination which is upcoming soon. So, stay tuned. So students welcome to the very first article where we will be discussing about how the votes in elections in the country are actually calculated. Now here I hope that all my fellow aspirants have casted their vote, their own democratic rights in the elections and today is the big day where the results will be declared today. So now let us actually focus on how those results are actually calculated. Now, this is a very, very important article from your prelims perspective, where there have been many questions from the representation of the People's Act and also how the elections in the country and also the various reforms in the country have been taking place on the ground of elections. And also from GS2 perspective, we have the salient features of the representation of the People's Act. So in this way, so let us first understand how the votes are actually calculated and firstly, who will be actually in charge when it comes to the counting of the votes. So here, the main authority will be the returning officer according to the election commission and also according to the section 21 of the RPA Act 1951, the returning officer is actually appointed by the election commission of India. And here, the person is generally the district magistrate in that particular district and also for a particular constituency and also can be more than a particular constituency too. And here, the returning officer is actually responsible for the conduct of election in the particular constituency and also when it comes to the counting of the votes, right? And when it consists of, say, for example, in a particular constituency, when the votes have to count, be counted across one or more or two, three or four constituencies, there will be also an assistant returning officer in the case. Now, when we talk about counting, obviously we are talking about the counting of the electronic voting machines or the EVMs. Now, for this counting, the returning officer will not be counting individually the EVMs and the various records of the votes there. So, a returning officer will be having some others to help him. Now, these people are known as the counting officials who are appointed by the returning officers. Now, who are these counting officials? These counting officials were actually a, a part of a database of a software which has been created by the state elect chief electoral officer. Now, here the state CEO has actually a particular database from a software. So, there are a group of various gazetted officers and also various group D staff and various other people. So, from that database, randomly people will be chosen and they will be present at the counting vote counting center. And here, at the vote counting center, as you can see here in this picture, there will be many tables. At one table, at one counting table, there will be one counting supervisor who will be actually supervising all the counting things. Maybe he will not or she will not be directly taking part in the counting. That person will be super supervising only the counting that is happening at his or her table. Now, that counting official or supervisor must be a gazetted officer. Now, each counting hall will be having maximum of 14 counting tables, right? And also, the real people who are actually doing the counting right there, they are actually known as the counting assistant who are actually the group D employees of the government, of the state government or say even the central government, right? Now here, the micro observers will also be there who will be actually looking at the various say uh, processes, rules and standards if they are actually being followed at the various counting tables or not. So these three individuals, counting supervisors, counting assistant and micro observers will be present at the counting table and at the top there will be this returning officers. Now, when we talk about who is actually allowed inside the counting hall, as we can see, uh, there is this counting hall where the elect the EVMs are actually taken and the votes are individually counted, right? 
now here there actually are some people who are not allowed and there actually are some people who are authorized according to this particular act now the particular uh, you know uh, you know electoral candidates the various candidates who are contesting the polls they are definitely allowed because they have to be allowed to cross check if the voting vote counting is actually fair and transparent or not or if say uh, there has been any influence of money or power during the counting of the polls so that is why the candidates all of the candidates were contesting for their constituencies are actually allowed to be present along with their say uh, uh, electoral agents now since obviously uh, there is one political candidate there across various political parties now in a hall there will be 14 tables obviously that candidate will not be able to supervise all the 14 tables so for all the 14 tables that candidate can appoint some electoral agents from his or her side now Obviously, when we talk about this uh, people who are allowed inside this hall, they will be counting supervisors, counting assistant, micro observers as we have seen here. Then there will be other people who are authorized by the election commission of India and also the ECI observer. Then there will be some other public servants on election duty. Only those public servants who are prescribed according to the election commission of India to be performing the election duty, not all public servants. And also the various candidates, their own electoral agents and the counting agents too. Now there are some exceptions as to who will definitely be not under the public servants uh, say term. Police officers and government ministers are not public servants when it comes to the counting of the votes. And also no one is allowed to carry out any carry in any mobile phones except the election commission of India's observer because this observer finally he has a very very important role to play that is actually declaring the results and making the results finalized after which the RO will be formally signing the formality. So we'll be looking into the previous, you know, next slides here. Now, now where will be the votes be counted? This is actually a very, very important aspect according to uh, the various election rules and according to the various handbooks of the Election Commission of India. Now, according to the rule 51 of the, the conduct of election rules 1961, if we can all read it together, returning officials shall at least one week before the date or for the very first date fixed for the poll, appoint the place or the places where the counting of the votes will be done and the date of the time at which the counting will be commencing. So the final authority is actually with the RO and it is very very important for your examination that it can be one place or it can be places also. Now, according to Election Commission of India's handbook for returning officers, for the sake of uniformity across, for, for, for you know, uniformity in counting across the countries, because we have to understand that this is the, you know, a Lok Sabha election. So, across the country, the uniformity of counting of votes must be ensured. That is why the date and time of the counting is actually fixed by the commission when it comes to this particular Lok Sabha election and also for the various other Lok Sabha elections, right? Now, this particular counting preferably must be at the RO's headquarters or say the district headquarters, the DM's headquarters, right? But again, the Election Commission of India has further clarified that there is no legal objection even if the place is outside the limit of the constituency. So even if there are say some security issues, if there are some say technical issues, say network issues, so that, uh, you know, counting can also take outside the place of this constituency. And also under no circumstances can the counting of more than one assembly constituency can be taking simultaneously in a hall. That means at a time only one constituency uh, the election votes can be counted at one single time. So these are very very important points for both your prelims and both your mains because UPC can ask these questions for example with reference to uh, you know one assembly or two assembly uh, regarding the place, regarding the official, regarding the various agents. So it is very very important for all, us, all of us to be aware of this and finally we also have to understand how does the counting begin and progress. So it begins with obviously uh, recognizing two types of votes. We have the votes casted through the EVMs and also we have votes casted through the postal ballots. Generally the senior citizens or say officers on duty abroad and also across various of the parts of the country, they can actually uh, uh, say uh, cast their votes via postal ballots. So this postal ballots and the EVM votes are taken into consideration. So the uh, returning officer in all of these particular counting halls, they start firstly with the postal ballots and when they are done, they are 
uh, they actually start opening this EVM wards. And if you can look at this EVM machine, it is consisting of this ballot unit where the you know where we as citizens uh, choose our political parties and we cast our vote here, right? So these are the various election uh, you know symbols where we cast our vote. And this is the main control unit which is actually storing all the records of the votes here. And also if you can see here, there is a display screen here, and also there is a result button here. So result button will be actually uh, say uh, giving this kind of uh, uh, verified results after counting all of the votes there to the returning officer and to the various you know counting tables and here uh, there is a strong room in this places where the RO has chosen at the you know uh, counting area this is known as the strong room where the EVMs are actually stored now here these EVMs will be opened in the presence of RO you know assistant ROs if there are any the candidates their own agents so all of the people who are allowed in the hall they will be present and in their presence only the seal will be opened right firstly the EVMs are stored then they are opened then the entries are registered in the logbook and finally the seal is opened where the entire process is happening before all of the candidates all of the officers and also this process is videographed and also when we are talking about videographing the date and time of the video is also recording in the same then at each counting table the votes at one polling station is counted at a time and also only the control unit as I told only the control unit will be taken into considerations and also the vote count recording uh, recorded in the form 17c now form 17c was you know discussed in detail in the previous analysis sessions if you uh, have some discussions or say uh, confusions regarding the same you can watch the previous analyst too now with reference to the vote account uh, in the form 17C and the control unit, the votes will be started to be counted. And the counting supervisors will be recording the results in the part 2, that is actually the result of the counting of form 17C. So after counting, the records also have to be maintained simultaneously. So and finally, the ECI observer, the Election Commission of India observer, will be conducting parallel count after all the rounds have been completed, the counting rounds have been completed, the ECA observer will be parallelly randomly selecting any two EVM machine and the ECA observer will be then verifying on her or his own. And after this, finally, the RO will be announcing the result in and also this result will be recorded in the part 2 of the 17 C form, right? And finally, after everything has been completed in this manner, finally, the VVVAT, which is actually the voter verifiable paper audit trial, this section will also be verified. And this generally takes around one to two hours when, uh, according to the various votes polled across the various political parties, they will, this particular paper trial has to be also tallied with the EVM result and the postal valid result also. Now, after finally, this has entire thing has been done it is already the end of the day uh, say around 5 or 6 uh, pm so finally the result is declared during that time and by the time you're watching this video maybe you have already known who is actually going to form the next government of india for the next five years in the next article, we'll be looking into Mission Karma Yogi, which is actually uh, uh, according to a report by this Indian Institute of Public Administration, who assessed the impact and actually reported that there has been increased amount of performance when it comes to data analytics and the usage of e-governance tool by the civil service, by the government officials in the country. Now, we have to understand that this is a very, very important topic from Indian polity and governance perspective. From GS2, we have to also look into the various aspects of governance, e-governance, transparency, accountability and the need for reforms in the civil services. Now, we have to actually understand that India is aiming to become a developed country by 2047. Now, to become a developed country by 2047, India needs to reach or say increase its GDP to 30 trillion dollars and this is actually the goal that we have as of now and also we know that the particular vision of India is having uh, or say reaching its Amrit Kal, right? And also we have to understand the main challenge uh, of India actually to reach that goal is actually about the civil servants, about the government officials who are actually that not much enthused to implement this goal because there have been many allegations with reference to delays, red tape, 
uh, excessive amount of bureaucracy in India. So maybe one of the challenges will be coming from the government officials themselves. And that is why the main solution is here in the form of Mission Karmi Yogi. This was actually a very noble uh, say policy initiative taken in 2020 during the COVID crisis, where the main agenda, the main perspective of this particular Mission Karmi Yogi is actually to inculcate right attitude, right skill, right knowledge in our civil servants. And this is actually through actually building a new vision for uh, new India to become to make India a developed country by 2047. And here, the main features is firstly to focus on the competency building of the civil servants and all the government officials in the country. And when we are talking about competency building, it is obviously building in the right amount of skills, building in right amount of attitude, right? So this is actually through more and more rigorous amount of training of both new government officials and existing and also government officials who are very near to retirement. And here, they, uh, this particular mission is actually based on personalized learning because here the government officials based on their various tenures in their say uh, you know uh, government job cycle they will be taken and they will be actually trained on various aspects this can be an aspects of say use of rt applications it can be based on say the delivering of various objectives of government schemes it can be also training the government service uh, servants on the say information technology or it use of computer ai machine learning and so on it is actually almost like an on-job training for government servants. And here, this will be also based on with the private-public collaboration, where maybe the government officials will be actually having to dedicate some on-site learning, mainly, uh, say, by gaining a mix of both classroom, say, uh, training, and also on-site training, mainly with private sectors. For example, the government officials involved in the DGC or the aviation uh, say policy affairs in the government of India, maybe they will be required to have or gain training from the various private air force, private airlines in collaboration with them. So this is also a very, very important aspect. Then there will be a shared learn, learning ecosystem where using various amount of say digital services, an ecosystem of this kind of training will be created. And finally, there will be also a digital portal which is known as IGOT Karma Yogi. And the very word Karma Yogi, it means that it is a particular government official or it is a particular Indian citizen who is very, very uh, determined in actually serving the people via his or her own, own karma. So the karma must be good according to Bhagavad Gita also. Your karma is your biggest virtue and you must be doing your own karma, you must be doing your own duties and you should not be worried about the fruits of your labor, fruits of your hard work. So the same thing applies to this particular philosophy for this mission Karma Yogi where the government officials are trained to perform their duties more efficiently and here the main goals are to shift from rule based that is following rigid rules, rigid laws and regulations to a role based human uh, say resource regulator. right? Then it is also uh, by building more and more enhanced skills and knowledge because it has been found that many government officials, including the senior government officials, they have found to be not very well proficient with the state of affairs of the day, with the various uh, say uh, technologies of the day. So they will be also trained on this. And finally, everything will be translating into improved public service delivery, which will be also ensuring last mile connectivity and last mile delivery of government services to the people of the country. It will be leading to ease of living of the citizens. It will lead to ease of doing business for the business houses. And finally, at the core, the citizens will be at the very most important primal point. Now here, when we're talking about building a citizen-centric and future-ready civil services, this mission Karmi Yogi is actually having a structure for that. Now, this entire structure at the head is actually the Prime Minister's HR Council. It is followed by the Cabinet Secretary Coordination Unit. And under the same, we have the Capacity Building Commission and the Special Purpose Vehicle, which is also 100% government-owned. At the very end, we have the you know National Program for Civil Services Capacity Building. Right now, here we understand this is actually the hierarchy. This is actually the structure how this mission Karma Yogi will be delivered. And here, the Prime Minister himself or herself is directly involved in this particular aspect. Right now, India will be transforming under this mission, right, by, by actually uh, having this 3 million civil servants in the country into citizen-centric, 
future ready and result oriented and when i am mentioning all these terms it is very very important for all of you to please use these terms in your gs2 answers and also in your gs4 answers now if we can talk a little bit more about the successes of this uh, you know mission karma yogi so far from 2020 to 2024 the uh, main aspect will be that say the main hierarchical uh, authority will be the capacity building commission who will be actually having this uh, faculties having this uh, you know capacity building having this main training initiatives for the civil servants here now let us look at some of the important case studies where you can actually mention this case studies in your answers now firstly we start with this pm gati shakti platform which is actually a infrastructural scheme which tries to bring or say harmonize all of the government of india's ministry department on a single platform for example there must be there may be a permission uh, needed for the construction of a bridge right of a bridge and maybe this bridge is located at say the periphery of a forest right and also say a town and say for example this bridge is also connected to the national highways right so maybe to construct this bridge you need the permission from the environment ministry when it concerns the forest you need also permission from the state government when it concerns the towns and cities and also you need permission from the ministry of Uh, you know highways also roads and national highways so that is where you understand a particular bridge or particular infrastructural facility needs a convergence or whole of government approach so that is where this mission karma yogi is becoming very very important here we have this gati shakti vishwavidyalay or gati shakti university which is actually training all the government officials to work on the harmony of such kind of projects so it is a very very important task for the various ministries to be in contact coordination with each other so this coordination is also being taught here along with the use of artificial intelligence internet of things big data analysis and also when it when we, when we talk about the real time say data or say the real time success data we find with reference to infrastructural development and the construction of new rail roads it actually grew from 4 kilometers per day to 12 kilometers per day as of 2024 that means more and more new rail lines are being constructed and also the bharat mala 2 is also seen as a success where 15 uh, national highway projects have been recently signed and mainly this is being attributed to this mission karmi yogi in the next uh, case study we find that this is also following a citizen centric training because the cbc has partnered with the ministry of home affairs to bring in reforms structural reforms in the police training and the railway services mainly by police training by say training the police officials in around say 10 to 20000 police stations and say areas of the country by bringing police more and more close to the people by increasing the trust of the people and training on how the uh, police must be behaving and also using the latest technology of the day it is also coordinated with the railway services by improved customer service products and also by delivering the various infrastructural aspects in the railway sector when it comes to tax administration cbc has also partnered with the central board of direct taxes and bringing in more and more clear and transparent tax tax returns uh, you know tax reforms such as improved amount of returns right then we have the high amounts of tax compliance in the last few years as we have seen over the last few years the amount of people who are paying income tax they have also increased also the income tax department has launched various reforms when it comes to the digital aspect so we find that when it comes to tax administration reforms mission karmi yogi has also Uh, and a build in this particular manner next when we talk about the role of state government and the municipal corporations even the state gov government is taking major benefits uh, from this particular aspect because india's targets of 2047 to become a developed country cannot be uh, say achieved without the cooperation of the states and particularly many countries you know many many cities in the country across various tier 1 cities tier 2 cities tier 3 cities right they are being trained particularly the municipal authorities even the gram sabhas right they are being trained in municipal finance road engineering and also solid waste management particularly various cities in uttar pradesh madhya pradesh maharashtra and also telangana andhra pradesh and so on we had finding that there have been improved amount of governance when it comes to this kind of thing and finally the internal transformation and the lifelong learning has also improved according to this report by this indian institute of public administration where it is been seen 
that there have been many government officials who are increasing the use of data analytics, the use of e-governance tools and also the use of various uh, consultancy firms in the country along with partnerships various NGOs and so on to actually inculcate best practices, global best practices is in, in, in India's own governance paradigm. And that is where we have to understand this is actually delivering the main functions of good governance and also this is also following you know the ethical governance norms where ethical values must be infused along with technology, along with training of the public servants, particularly when it comes to the governance of the country. So that is why we have to understand this mission Karma Yogi is a very, very important aspect for the future civil servants of the country and also all of my future bureaucrats who are watching me right now. Please be very, very aware of this particular mission and this can be a potential question in the exam. In the next article, we'll be looking into a very, very important piece of editorial, right? A very detailed piece of editorial indeed, right? When it comes to the right to property and also the compensation of the property associated with the same, right? Now, recently there has been a case, uh, uh, of, you know, registered and also... <clears throat> now, recently there has been a case uh, uh, on the behalf of the Kolkata Municipal Corporation regarding a land seizure by the West Bengal government. That land was a private land. That means the land actually be belonged to the private individual, right? So, the state government actually seized the land and started doing public work on the same. Right, so that is what we have to understand the entire history of the right to property and how over a period of time via various Supreme Court and the various constitutional amendments it has come to face as of now. Now, it is a very important aspect uh, for your UPSC prelims for Indian Polytan governance and also for GS2 where we have the Indian constitution and the various features, basic uh, features, uh, uh, evolution and the understanding of the same. Now, when we talk about property rights, right, we have to actually look at this historical tug of war. Why tug of war? Because firstly, we have to understand when it when we talk about property, right, according to US President John Adams, if you can, you know, remember this quote, property is surely a right of mankind as real as liberty. You know, liberty is actually that essence of freedom to develop your own, say, uh, uh, all round development and also to develop your own skills, your own say uh, liberal uh, uh, temperament and so on. And also this can help you lead a dignified life. And if we understand property is actually one of the uh, uh, you know components of liberty too, because without property, human liberty is actually not a reality at all. Because we have to understand that right to shelter is actually a very, very basic human right. That is why we have to understand that right to property is actually one of the most important debates when it comes to the Indian political circles. Now here, the right to property, you know, pre-1978 was actually a fundamental right, right, under Article 191F, right, and also Article uh, 31, which actually gave compensation uh, uh, clauses for the, uh, you know, uh, right to property and also acquisition of property by the state, right? So, it was actually before 1970s a fundamental right. And also in the Bela Banerjee case of 1955, uh, the compensation under Article uh, 31 too was actually, uh, you know, told by the Supreme Court that the compensation for any property, if the property has been taken by the state, for say any public purposes, for example, say building roads, schools, colleges and so on. So government from time to time can actually acquire some properties from the private individuals. It is all right for any public goods, for any public affairs, public welfare. Now it is perfectly fine. But the compensation according to the Bela Banerjee case of 1955, the Supreme Court told that it must be just equivalent to the amount of value it actually accrues to the owner of the land, that is a private land. So it made a point that is very, very clear that the compensation by the state to the private individuals must be just equivalent to the market prices. Now here, the government became very unhappy with the Supreme Court case here. And here, in the Constitution Fourth Amendment Act 1955, the uh, parliament actually moved this constitutional amendment to prevent the courts from questioning the adequacy of the constitution, you know, of the compensation of this you know, property. Now here, this when we talk about the adequacy, that means, at you know, in 1950s, it has been seen that the 
you know state governments were actually acu you know acquiring the private land right from the people at far more for far less market prices so that is what uh, this compensation aspect was actually gaining into picture and also constitution 25th amendment 1971 it actually replaced compensation with amount in article 2 uh, 31 2 so it is actually uh, you know diluting the value of compensation when it comes to the acquisition of land by the government now a very very important amendment came finally in constitutional amendment uh, 44th constitutional amendment act of 1978 when the fundamental right of property right to property under article 19 1f and also the compensation under article 31 was actually deleted from the constitution right and here in the place of this article 300a was inserted where right now according to article 300a the right to property is a constitutional right obviously but no more a fundamental right now because the government that day actually focused on implementing the socialist agendas of the government that is well this well distribution say uh, social justice measures and also the various welfare schemes for this the government needed more land and that is why uh, the property rights were actually f uh, coming as a hurdle to the very socialistic goals of the government and hence these articles were actually diluted and in the place article 300a was introduced and when we talk about the post amendment scene particularly we have to look at the various supreme court cases one supreme court case uh, or two supreme court cases and actually prior to 1978 that is firstly ak gopalan case versus state of madras that is 1950 so here the supreme court actually allowed the state to take possession of any property for public order so actually this was actually in the favor of the government of the day right and in the case of nanda bharati case right uh, while the right to property was not a direct issue here the main is the main aspect that came to the feature is the basic structure of the constitution and here we have to understand basic structure of the constitution is actually following the ideals of the constitution the main values enshrined in the constitution also the main values we can see directly in the identity card of the constitution that is our preamble right that is liberty equality opportunity and these are the main aspects of the uh, constitution where also we understand basic structure is actually one of the most important feature here next in the minerva mills case of 1980 the right to property was actually called as a constitutional right finally by the supreme court because obviously we have article 300 for the same and also in the mc mata case and the bk ravi chandra case uh, in 1985 and 2020 respectively the supreme court actually told that the laws depriving individuals of property must be just fair and reasonable that is if the pop, you know government is taking the land of the people the government must be assuring enough compensation to the people and finally, right, the Nanbai Kachar case versus the state of Gujarat in 1995, uh, the Supreme Court told that the right to property, while it is a constitutional right, it is not a part of the basic structure. But again, it is a constitutional right, but it is not a part of the basic structure. But we have to understand the main thing that actually emanated from the Supreme Court verdicts is that obviously citizens have this right to be compensated because obviously the right to property is a basic human right, right? And also since the same article 300 is there, no matter it is not a fundamental right anymore, but it is a constitutional right nevertheless. And if the people of the country are having the constitutional rights, obviously the people must be compensated fairly because they cannot be, uh, say, gotten the read of, uh, you know, to live a dignified life here. Now, uh, recently in this particular uh, editorial, this, there is this talk of this Kolkata Municipal Corporation versus Bimal Kumar Shah case of 2024, where the judiciary actually recognized this power of eminent domain. Now, what is what do you mean by eminent domain? It is actually uh, the same thing that any kind of property can be actually taken by the government. It is all right if the particular property is taken for public purposes, that is building roads, schools, colleges and so on. But again, the owner must be receiving just compensation in exchange for the acquisition of their property. So, you know, the judiciary here reaffirmed that this eminent domain principle must be adhered to in this particular case. And also, Supreme Court further observed here that the right to property is protected as a constitutional right and has been 
interpreted to be as a human right. So finally, the Supreme Court has also linked the right to property as a human right and as a constitutional right. It doesn't matter if it is not a fundamental right, but the right nevertheless. And finally, the, uh, according to Article 300, no person shall be deprived of his property save by the authority of the law. Now, obviously, there must be an authority of the law to be said by the parliament or say to be said by the state legislature. Now, if this authority of the law is not there or say there is no authority to actually manage this land acquisition by the government and so on, in particular state governments. So, it is not the responsibility of the private citizens that if the authority is there or not. Because the constitution tells that there must be an authority and there must be say uh, uh, this kind of constitution rise to the people for their property. So that is why if the state governments, for example, the West Bengal government here complain that we do not have any authority of law, how can we give this kind of compensation? So the Supreme Court told that interpretation of authority of law right must be interpreted via this uh, article 300a which is a constitutional right so you cannot deny that you do not have an authority of law you do not have a commission you do not have an authority you do not have a management uh, uh, aspect here so you cannot you, you, you will not be giving the right you have to give it because it is a constitutional right and also supreme court gave these seven magic principles or say seven guidelines for say uh, various aspects of land acquisition by the state or say by the government when it comes to the private land right so it is actually the right to notice or the duty of the state to inform a person that the land will be cured, the right to be citizen to be heard, right, or the duty of the state to be here to hear the objections of the citizens also, the right of the citizen to a reasoned decision, or the right of the state to inform the person of his decision to acquire a property, then the right of the state to determine that the acquisition is exclusively for public purposes, not for private purposes later, the right of the citizens to be to have a fair uh, compensation and duty of the state to conduct the process of acquisition efficiently and within the prescribed timelines also. And finally, there must be a right of the conclusion of the proceedings too. The citizens cannot be left forever in the annals of this, uh, you know, uh, acquisition aspect here. So, this is a very, very important Supreme Court case. Please do note it down in all your notes and also we have covered a comprehensive aspect of the right to property here. In the next article, we'll be looking into the falling ball nails and here we'll be looking into the various uh, aspects of this concept here. It is a very, very important topic for UPC prelims, economic and social development and also GS3, Indian economy, where you can use such case studies to illustrate your answers. Now, when we discuss the concepts of bond deal, it is very, very important to start with the very basics. When we're talking about bonds, right, we're talking about, say, a debt. For example, if the bond is issued by the government, government is taking a debt from the people of the country. Now, let us imagine the price of the bond is 100 rupees and say, for example, after one year, maybe the government will be giving a 5% interest rate. So, after one year, the bond will be rated at 105 rupees uh, and here, the 5 rupees will be actually a profit for the people who are actually buying the bond. So, that is why and also, the bonds are actually very, very safe and secure because if you invest in the government bonds, the government will be always there. Government is not there to go away. So it is also very safe and reasonable uh, mode of investment for the people. Now imagine that we have also the various private companies, right? For example, Jio Adani and so on. Now these companies also issue bonds. Now, for example, also these companies have stocks. Now let us uh, say, assume, uh, take an example of a stock, right? Which is actually, say, for example, on an annual basis, giving you 8% interest rate, right? For example, if you invest 100, 100, 100 rupees right now, you'll be getting 108 rupees later. But maybe this company is actually not that much of stable. So that is why people will be opting for the government bond more. So this is during the normal times. Now maybe for example, for example, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, private company stock here, maybe uh, became actually more say for example say 10 percent now maybe the people actually are thinking that okay if i have this 100 rupees of government bond right now right and i want to invest 100 rupees here so let me sell my 100 rupees of government bond for 90 rupees for whatever rupees i have right now for whatever rupees the market will be giving me for the bond right now and i will be investing these 90 rupees in this particular private company bond right or say private company stock which is giving me 10 percent return because right now the rewards are much more than the risks okay so that is why the people sometimes will be tempted to sell their government bonds and going into the private say share or stock markets right so there is nothing wrong with this and actually the more people invest in the private companies of our country 
the more money they will be getting or say the private companies will be getting for investment and with investments they will be actually expanding their businesses building up new factories giving more employment and say increasing the gdp right so actually when people invest more in the private sector we find that obviously uh, uh, there is more scope of investment and more increase of gdp but here we have to understand one thing now if the government bond is falling too much or say the government bonds price that is say which was 100 rupees earlier it became 90 rupees right now maybe for example it became 60 rupees right now now if we understand that the final person who bought this bond for 60 rupees at the end of the year how much he will be getting 105 rupees so you can understand he will be getting 45 rupees of profit or more than 46 47 percent of returns so obviously when obviously when we will be understanding we will be calculating this return of government bonds right we found that the price of the bond earlier was 100 rupees now it declined to right say 60 rupees now what will be the actual return actual return will be calculated on the final return of 105 rupees right even if divided by 60 right and it will be getting it will be giving us around 45 46 47 percentages right so let us consider around 47 percentage right now compare this 47 percent to the 10 percent of the private sector shares now obviously the people will be going crazy and again people will be investing in the government bonds right now why the people are investing in government bonds because first reason right now the prices of the government bond has fallen very low so it is very cheap and finally the final return of 105 rupees is actually very much higher so people will be getting a profit of 45 rupees 50 rupees and so on so firstly this is the main thing second reason can actually come from the private sector sides maybe the private sector companies are not performing well now where the people will be investing directly in the government bonds right so this is actually uh, uh, actually a phenomena which take place in the market more uh, often and if you see if the prices decreased the bond yields which is actually nothing but the overall returns right that increased because at 100 rupees our normal profit would be 105 rupees that is only 5 rupees or 5 percent right now this particular profit has increased to 40 rupees so we can understand the profit has increased now the same thing means that the return an investor is expected to receive on a bond if the person is holding the bond till maturity that has also increased or simply the bond yield has also increased so simply we found that if prices increase right the bond yields will be decreasing if prices reduced in our case the bond yields will be increasing so there is actually if we understand if you understand the relationship between bond prices and bond yields there is actually an inverse relationship between bond prices and bond yields right so the main significance is here that the government's borrowing cost will be coming into place that means for example if right now the you know uh, uh, say the bond yield in the market it around say 40 percent so maybe if the government is seeking to borrow more from the people the government has actually to give or say offer more than 40 percent interest rate otherwise the people will not be buying any bond because they are anyways getting 40 percent from the previous bonds if the government now wants to issue new bonds the government has to pay more than 40 percent to the people that means it will be leading to increase of cost for the government right then also the overall economic activity will also be uh, affected or indirectly or uh, you know indirectly by a government bonds it is generally observed then when the government bond yields are very very high the economic condition of the country is actually not good that means because people i told you are not investing in the private sector companies and if the private sector companies are not getting money investments will be low gdp will be coming down so that is why the bond yields to be higher that is the government bond yields to be higher is not a good sign for the economic activity right and what are the various factors that affect the bond yields firstly the interest rate now we understand that if we take a particular bond say for example the bond is having 5% interest rate now if the bank interest rate for example fixed deposit interest rate is at 10% now where you will be investing your money obviously at the fixed deposit rate right you will be not buying any government bonds now for example say this 
say fixed deposit interest rate has been increased to 15 percent right now people who are having this bond they will be selling the bond right and they will be investing in or say keeping their money in the fixed deposit now if you understand interest rate of other products for example fixed deposits and so on right the bank interest rates if the bank interest rates rise the people will be selling bonds and if the people sell bonds the supply of bond increases and if the supply increases the price of the bond decreases so interest rates rise price of the bond decreases again we find again we find that whenever interest rates rise price of the bond falls and we know that when price of the bond falls yield goes up that means when interest rates rise, yields go up also. And also the opposite is true. When interest rates come down, the prices go up and the yields go down. So this is simply the relationships between interest rate, bond and the yields. And finally, inflation is also a very important factor because the total amount of say return to a particular investor is known as nominal return, which is actually the real return plus the bond yields. So we understand actually the real return is actually the nominal return minus bond yield. That is actually we understand if the bond yields increase too much, the real return that you will be getting will be far lower. That means if there is high inflation in the economy, right, we find that the value of real worth of your money, right, decreases and that is why the bond yield also increases in this manner. Finally, it is also reflecting the credit worthiness of the issue, issuer. That is, that means that it reflects how well a particular bank, a particular company, a particular government is actually paying the money back in particular periods of time. And also, if the companies, private companies are not doing well, maybe the private companies will not be able to pay back the money right and that is what will be also reflecting the credit worthiness of this private company so this is also one of the factors which is affecting bond yields right because you have to understand credit worthiness means your ability to pay back the money that you have borrowed in the past right and if you are not say paying back the money that you have borrowed from the banks you are defaulting and defaulting or say not paying back the loans is not a good economic activity that will be you know decreasing or say impacting the economic activity and finally GDP also right now recently as we have seen right the government bond yields are actually coming down now it is actually a good thing because we know that the lower yields of the government bond is good because maybe right now more and more people are investing in the stock market are investing in other avenues where the private sector is actually getting this kind of avenues and it is been expected that it is actually due to the confidence of the people in the present government of the day according to various economic experts. In the next one, we'll be looking at green beard genes, which is a very, very interesting concept because scientists recently have gained valuable insights into natural altruism, which is actually studying by an amoeba, right? And here, this is a very, very important article from your syllabus perspective when it comes to general science in prelims. And here, we have to understand this is a term or green beard is a term which is actually uh, for the very first time was mentioned by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Shellfish Gene. Now this gene is a very special gene which shows altruistic behavior, which recognizes and preferentially cooperate with each other when it comes to say, for example, the worker honeybees, when it comes to the meerkats, human beings, or even some widow spiders. We know that there are many species of ants, bees, and various animals like elephants and so on, they cooperate with each other. Even human beings like us, we try to cooperate with each other for bigger goals in our lives, right? So this is due to actually a gene in our say a chromosome and in our DNA. So that is actually known as the green beard genes, right? And this is the evidence which was found in this amoeba which this amoeba they do what they altruistically sacrifice themselves they give up their lives to actually prevent any cheaters in their community because there can be various cheaters in the microscopic communities to actually feed on the algae or say the various amoeba themselves now here this is actually a process where the uh, amoeba eat themselves or say sacrifice their lives and finally they prevent the entire community from getting disrupted. So this is the main concept of this green beard genes. 
finally, we'll be discussing four more important prelims snippet where we'll be starting with indelibent ink. And here, according to Election Commission of India, to prevent bogus voting on the polling dates, obviously we know all of the voters are have to actually given an you know indelibent ilk uh, marked on the left forefinger, which cannot be removed easily, right? And for the very first time in the country, it was uh, actually a uh, you know uh, developed by the Election Commission of India by the request of CSIR, right? And then the in India as of now, the sole license of the same is with the Mysore Paints and Varnish Limited, and it contains a silver nitrate, which is a colors colorless compound, and it is visible when exposed to the ultraviolet light, and uh, it can persist up to around. 72 hours that means up to 72 hours you cannot remove it you cannot uh, say use any kind of chemicals to kind of remove the same and actually apart from say using the same in the Indian elections uh, election commission of India actually gave the permission to the government of the day to use uh, uh, say this indelible link for the COVID pandemic purposes to actually mark people who were actually quarantined and who were actually treated for COVID purposes in the next one, we'll be looking at this Agniban project, which is actually the second uh, private suborbital rocket. It is second because India's first privately developed rocket is actually Skyroots Vikram series of space launch vehicle. And when we're talking about private companies, we're actually talking about our own Indian companies who are privately, uh, say, without any kind of, say, direct government help, they're building this kind of uh, uh, rockets for future space operations and this is a completely uh, having a 3d printed engine which is known as the agni late engine 6 kiloton say 6 kilo newton it is having a semi cryogenic engine also and it is also customizable launch vehicle can be launched in one or two stages and the payload range is around say below 100 kg and also it can reach to an altitude of 700 kilometers so these are all the important aspects mainly the term and who is actually owning it, say the government or the private sector is actually important for your examination. In the next one, we'll be looking at this Preston curve, which is a very, very important empirical relationship, which is showing the life expectancy and the GDP per capita relationships between the same. As we can see, uh, whenever the GDP of a country increases over a period of time, the life instance, life expectancy of the people also increases because when more and more incomes come to the people's uh, uh, say disposable income right it leads to better quality of education food nutrition and also health services and this actually leads to higher life expectancy or better livelihood so that is why we find that the countries with the low per capita income or say countries like nigeria bangladesh pakistan indonesia and even india china mexico Brazil. So these are actually the countries we are having low per capita income, right? And also the countries here up to now, as we can see here, having around say 60 years of life expectancy. And the countries who are having per capita income of more than $20,000, $30,000 per year, such as Spain, Italy, France, US, Germany, they're having more life expectancy because the people in the country have higher incomes, right? And as we can see, this is a term was, which was framed by Samuel H. Preston. That is why the name of Preston curve and the increasing slope is actually having the various low income developing countries and other developing nations. Upward slope is actually people in the richer nations and they actually tend to live longer in, than in the poorer countries. But there are some limitations in this particular curve. Firstly, the complexities of life expectancy is actually very, very, uh, say, complex when it comes to medical field. And also the medical advancements as of now has become very, very advanced over the time. And even in the low income, develop, uh, low income countries and the developing countries, we see that over a period of time, they are actually improving the life expectancy actually improving. In the next one, we'll be looking into this periods of price, which is actually awarded for the achievements in journalism, literature and drama. Established in 1917 by Joseph Pulister, it is right now administered by the Columbia University in New York City. And this is awarded yearly in 21 categories. It is very, very important because UPC in recent years, they have been asking questions on awards and recognitions. And here the most amount of prizes go to journalism, followed by letters, drama and music and sometimes even special citations for various individuals across the world. Now the record for most Pulitzer Prize goes to Robert Frost. If you all have read his most famous poem, which is The Road Not Taken, you can definitely understand why he has won the most number of Pulitzer Prizes 
under poetry and also all uh, categories combined. And it is also recommended that you code this uh, the row not taken in your mains answers in your essays to enhance the value of your answers. And finally, there are some Indian Pulitzer Prize winners. The very first Indian was Gobind Bihari Lal in 1937, followed by Siddharth Mukherjee for his book on cancer. Then Geeta Anand for her uh, contributions to investigative journalism. And finally, Danish Siddiqui in 2022 for the various contributions towards photography. So here we are at the end of the discussion. I thank you all for being a very, very patient audience. Please do attend the quiz which is following up. Till we meet again, all the best for your future endeavors. Thank you.